is uh, your Hosho vine will look like once you plant it. This is approximately two months old, maybe two and a half months old. They're very, very fast growers, and as you can see, they need a lot of sprawling room. We've actually sort of confined these into this area. They would be growing a lot further out if we would let them. And the flowers that you see only last for a few days, and they only open in the early morning and uh, twilight hours. Uh, they're not a daytime flower. Um, this is what the gourds look like when they first form. You can see that the, the flower part whoop, is, has died off there, and they have uh, a lot of fuzz on them, and the, the, uh, the, the bumps aren't really that well defined yet. But if you look over here, this one's a little further along, and you can see still got the fuzz, but the, the um, knobbiness is starting to become distinct and you can see the nice curved handle forming. You want to make sure that these gourds always rest on the ground, otherwise if they hang straight down you're going to get straight handles which is um, makes it harder to play. And then there's one over here that's almost full sized. Let's see if I can find it. It's in here. The leaves kind of hide them in the morning. This one <coughs> You can see it there. Has got the, the very distinct maranca uh, knobs already well formed on it, and a lot of that fuzz has disappeared. These are what your purebred maranca seeds are going to look like. You can see the scale of their size there. And when you're selecting which seeds to plant, if you've gotten your own seeds out of a maranca gourd or somebody has given you some, you want to look for the, the, um, the nice dark color and I always figure the bigger the seed, the better. I don't know if that's really true. But what you want to definitely avoid are discolored white seeds that look like they're underdeveloped um, because they probably are. It's e if a maranca gourd hasn't reached full maturity, um, the seeds don't either. And I was told never to plant those, and it's been my experience that they, they don't germinate. When you make the decision to grow maroncas, you have to make the decision not to grow any other members of the curcubit family like cucumbers, squash, watermelons, zucchini, and you also have to hopefully have neighbors that don't grow them because what the uh, maronca vine will do is cross-pollinate with those other types of vine plants and if that were to happen, what you end up with is a hybrid. And here is an example. Now my neighbor over there is growing cucumbers. And I don't know if this maronca gourd cross-pollinated with a cucumber or maybe with somebody's zucchini since the color is kind of zucchini-like. But you can see that all the knobbiness has been lost and the shape is also a little bit um, altered. If you look at the flowers, you notice that the male and female flowers are different. This is a female flower, and you can tell because it's got the gourd sort of body started over there, right underneath it. You can see this is the part that's going to get bigger on the gourd. If you look at a male flower, you'll notice that it doesn't have that same kind of bulging underneath the flower. Now, since we don't have any insects that fly at night or early in the morning at the times that these are open, it's important to make sure that the plant gets pollinated with its own pollen from the male plant to the female plant. So what you do is gather up some pollen and gather them up, gather it up on a brush and transfer the pollen from the male plant to the female plant. You can just pick up some pollen on a brush from the male plant and transfer it to the female plant.
This is a great example of a purebred Maranca. Uh, it's quite big, you can see in relation to my hand, that it's pretty much ready to be harvested. I don't think you'd want it much bigger than that. Um, one thing about growing gourds is that you really have to check your gourds every day. Um, you can check it every day and it seems like it's just getting to be the same size, no, no changes, and you get kind of blasé about it. And then you come out three or four or five days later and it's doubled or tripled in size. It's just incredible. It's almost like you could sit there and watch it grow. So I'm going to harvest. I've got three or four in here. Uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and harvest them. I don't want them much bigger than that. So when you're harvesting, of course, you have to be incredibly gentle and try not to even scratch the surface of the skin because anything, in, any break in the, the soft skin right now will later invite rotting um, and it will also just be a potential crack in a dried gourd. So you want to be extremely gentle. So what I would do is just cut it off first and give yourself a little bit of a tail. Some people like those tails on the gourd. It sort of reminds you that it was once a growing thing. And then just lift it out nice and gently. Yeah, this one's perfect. You can see this is pretty typical, the, the blondness on the bottom where it didn't get sun. You know, another thing about gourds, as you can probably tell, is that they like to hide. I didn't even know some of these were in here. You can see how the, um, the leaves create kind of a blanket, so you really have to kind of pull them back and really check. The leaves are green and the gourds are green, so it's really hard to see when you've got a ripe fruit. Here's another one hiding in here. Nice curved handle. Oh yeah. Another nice thing about gourds that's kind of interesting to observe is that they have a triangular structure. When they're really perfectly formed, you get three ridges that create three kind of flatter panels. And it's really nice when the ridge, this one isn't so perfect for this consideration, but when one of the flat panels is on the very top of the gourd, when you would be holding it. See, this one's got the ridge on the top. That's not as good as when you've got the flat panel on the top where you're playing it most of the time and you get a nice flat playing surface. Maybe some of those other ones will have the flat surface on the top of the gourd. It's really hard to control the shape of the handle. You never really know what you're going to get. For instance, sometimes you get that. Now, what I would do is when it's dry, I would just take a bandsaw and just cut it off and uh, cap it with something because that's just going to get in the way when you try to play it. This one's got the flat surface on the top. Oh, that's a nice small one. Up oh, slug. Yeah, some, some certain kind of bugs like to chew into these and eat them, so um, sometimes I spray them with safer soap, makes them taste bad to the bugs, but really you don't, bug damage is not a, a huge problem for growing them, I've found, that's been my experience. There's a caterpillar. Hey, caterpillar, what are you doing? I don't like you on my gourds. Kind of a straight handled one. Oh, this one might have got a little too big. Got away from me. That's nice. You can see some example of some kind of damage there. I don't know if that was an insect. It's probably some insect that's chewed in and it's sort of gooing up, kind of bleeding. Um, that's something I guess you want to try and prevent by uh, safer soaping. Or just coming out and inspecting your gourds every day and 
taking off any bugs. Nice curvy handle. So you can see towards the root of the vine how the leaves are starting to die. They kind of discolor, turn brown, start dying. That's sort of a sign that you know the end is near. Um, you definitely want to start thinking about harvesting at this point. You don't have to though. I just harvested those because they were fully sized. They were as big as I wanted them to be. It's nice to have a little space to work on your gourds. It can be kind of messy somewhere out in the garage or the basement. Um, this is where I do most of my gourd cleaning and my gourd drying and my cork carving. So I'm going to try and dry these gourds that I just harvested. Um, last year it took over a year for them to completely dry and turn brown. These are the gourds that are left from last year's drying process so you can see the difference in, in color. I think that it takes a long time to dry them in Oregon because our winters are so damp. Um, I know that my uh, some people that I buy gourds from say, oh, it only takes four or five months. Um, and I've never found that to be the case in Oregon. So what I do is I just set them up, spaced apart, not touching one another, that's very important, and I just sit them there and I don't really do anything to them. Um, I like to have them sitting on a cloth so that they're not sitting against anything that can collect moisture and cause rotting. Um, I do occasionally come down, maybe every month, and turn them to a different side of the triangle so that each side gets equal exposure to air. But really all you do is you have to have a lot of patience and it might take over a year. I probably made maybe a thousand or fifteen hundred Hosho at this point. And so I feel like I know a lot about it. <laughs> and I'd like to let you guys know how to do it. Um, there are a lot of mistakes you can do, that, and some of them aren't real obvious, and so I'd just like to save you guys that all those heartbreaking, you know, moments when you've crunched your gourd. Um, so that's what I want to do. I'm, I'm going to talk just a little bit in the beginning about growing, in case some of you guys want to try and grow them. Um, I'm selling seeds. They're 50 cents each. They're a super pure variety of the Maronka gourd, which has been gradually going extinct in this country for a while, and so the Gourd Society of America kind of woke up and said, whoa, you know, either we need to do something about it, or it's just the way. that's what Hosho gourds, those real knobby things, they're called Maronka gourds. If you decide you want to grow those, and you want them to be real knobby, and you don't want them to hybridize with something else, you can't grow anything else in that family, which includes all other gourds, obviously. Cucumbers, squash, pumpkins, zucchini. I had a nice, interesting cross one year with zucchini. <laughs> you see here are ones that we harvested maybe two weeks ago mm -hmm. off of our vine that we're growing right in the middle of the city, uh, Portland, on the parkway between the sidewalk and the street. Oh, <laughs> so that is what the seeds will produce if you grow them in isolation. How far away yeah. is isolation? <laughs> you know, bees and wind, wow. it's sort of a crapshoot, you know. Right. So. <laughs> The distance. It, my neighbor, I we did. I didn't. Um, my book that I have talks about hand pollination of the flowers. So the, the gourd pollinates itself. It's one of those kind of plants that you know self pollinate. Some of the flowers are male and some are female. You have to be able to recognize which is which, which isn't hard. I use a Q-tip. I know there's real fancy stuff you can buy to do this. I use a Q-tip and just transfer male pollen to a female flower. Um, and then some people that get really fanatical about it will tie a paper bag over that flower to just ensure that no other pollen gets in there. And one vine produced 20 gourds, and of those 20, only one had obviously pollinated with, I think it was my neighbor's cucumber. So, um, and it was smooth. It might have been a zucchini, actually. It's hard to tell, you know. But it, you know, it, it was smoother. Don't let it show us up, climb up a fence or, or anything, unless you want posho that hang, the handles hang straight and then they get very long in the middle of the So you want it to be on the ground. If you leave them on the ground, most of them will naturally curve like that, okay? 
so no trellising. Um, watering, you, you have to make the watering sort of even, like don't give it a period of drought and then a period of plenty, because it makes the gourd grow in little bursts, and it creates, let me see if we got any, I think we were real careful about it. Maybe some of, if you guys are cleaning your gourds and you start to notice these, I don't know what to call them, not really defects, and so, sometimes they're kind of pretty, but irregularities in the surface of the gourd that look like cracks, that's because it had a period of drought and then it got a lot of water and it sort of, it split. It's like stretch marks or something. So even watering, also, you don't want to cut them off too early because if the seeds inside of them don't reach maturity and you cut it off, you have a higher likelihood that the gourd will rot instead of dry. Okay? So there's something about when the gourd knows that the seeds it's carrying inside of it are mature, it, it hardens to that, you know, that nice hard shape so you can shape them like that. So I thought, well, I don't know if those seeds are mature. You know, I don't know how to tell, actually. Maybe there's a way, but I don't know it. And so I thought, I'll leave it on the vine a couple more days just to make sure those seeds are mature. And in one day, it went from the perfect size to too big. So check them every day. Um, I would say if it's getting too big, just take your chances and cut it off because if it's too big, you're not going to want it anyway. So. Um, but just be very attentive to it. And one thing that you could do to make sure that the seeds are still getting mature but it's not getting too big is to stop watering it. Okay? Just cut off the supply. And the problem for us in Portland is that it's already raining every day. So we don't, I don't know where you guys are from, but if you're from California or something, um, or somewhere that it's dry, you have total control over the water that's being received. So cut off the water supply when you think the gourds are getting to about to the right size. It's in there, and last year our gourds took exactly a year to dry. So, but we live in Portland where it's humid in the winter, you know, it rains, mists every day. So I think that has something to do with it. Some people I know that grow them in Georgia dry them in four months. So, um, and check them a lot. You know, you tend to want to put these away somewhere where you don't see them very much while they're drying. Um, make yourself a note to go check them every couple of days because, you, you know, if you get 20 boards, the odds are one or two are going to rot instead of dry, and you don't want them contaminating the other boards. You want to just, you know, you'll, you'll know it too because they just like start to cave in on themselves. And, um, if, you, if you don't want to throw them away, at least isolate them. I actually had one cave in on itself and it looked like it was going to rot. I took it somewhere else and sort of babied it along. And it actually ended up hardening and it made a fine ho show. It just was, looked like somebody had punched it in the nose. So, but get it away from the other words. Um, as soon as possible, after the last frost, you know when that's going to be. Um, I germinate mine indoors. Um, I either soak them in a glass of distilled water for a couple of days to sort of get that little thing started, you know, the germination. Um, somebody told me to put them between piece, two pieces of wet, wet flannel and put them in a warm spot. And you know where a nice warm spot is? Right on top of your refrigerator. It tends to, the lower, it tends to make it just the right temperature. Um, and uh, just a couple of days on that, and when it germinates, um, <coughs> Planted outside. Um, these, this plant doesn't transplant well. You know, you, you can grow things inside and then you take them outside and plant them. Um, if you have to do that, which I actually did one year because <coughs> our growing season is not too long, buy those little things that you can pop it out so that you're not disturbing the roots hardly at all. There's something about this family of plants that if the roots get disturbed, the plant really never recovers. I don't know why that is, but. And don't let it get too big inside, you know. So this year we didn't plant inside at all. We germinated inside a couple days in water. And then we just put them right outside in the garden. We actually got a real late start on it. And we still got boards. So I don't know. I don't know where you guys are from. So it's going to be different for all of you. Um, the other thing is, at the end of the growing season, you don't want, as soon as you get one even even if it's just exactly 32 degrees, the tiniest bit of frost, the whole plant will just die. It's those big leaves, those big broad leaves, in one day they'll go from lush and green to just black nuts from the tiniest bit of frost. So when that happens, just go get your gourds. I'll say a couple things about picking out your gourds. There's no way that you're going to know what they're going to sound like 
by the way they look. Okay? The, the, the sound, most people think that a high pitched, very sharp sound is the most powerful sound. That has nothing to do with what the cord looks like on the outside. That has to do with how thick or thin the wall of the cord is. The thinner the wall, the louder and the brighter the sound. The thicker the wall, the duller the sound. The nice thing, though, about having a dull ho show with a thick wall is it's less likely to break. But most people want that thin wall. The other thing is the handle. Um, depending on the size of your, your hands, um, if you're a really big person and you don't mind having a slightly larger handle, I would say go for that if you have big hands. If you're a really tiny person, there are, I, I noticed that there are some that I would even almost call children's size. They're very, very tiny. So um, go by that. Um, you're going to need to pick out two. Each person gets two. I have a few extra, so if at some point in this whole process you crunch your board, don't panic and just start over, okay? I have four, okay? So when the fourth person breaks their board, you guys stop doing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, even if you all break your boards, I brought the stuff that I do to repair Hosho, and I have repaired the most amazing. I put back Hosho that looked like jigsaw puzzles with this stuff, and they never break after that. So, you know, cosmetically it's not the greatest thing, but um, don't panic. We'll fix your board. We'll send you out here with a decent set. So, just in terms of the relationship of the two boards to each other, do you, you probably want them size wise, you know, you want to match them up, but they might not end up sounding That's alike. Right. So, you know what my class did last year? They all worked on their boards, they got them all done, and dried them, and then they switched. And it's a totally up to you guys thing. If you can find somebody that's willing to do it, you can, you can do that, okay? Here's what I noticed. You're going to struggle with these wire brushes, right? You got your hands in this black mold suit, for one thing. You're scrubbing. If you don't have gloves on or you're not careful, and you, maybe you'll cut yourself with a wire brush, I have noticed that that nick gets, almost looks like gang green, okay? Um, and I have to like dump alcohol and stuff on it, Neosporin and every day. It just, um, it, it's just goopy stuff. If you have rings and jewelry on that you care about, might want to take them off, stick them in a pocket or something. So um, just please wear those gloves. And as you're wire brushing and also steel wooling them, just try not to cut yourselves or go through the gloves. If you, I got a lot of gloves, so if you tear your teeth, just get another pair. So let me let me explain what's going to happen. There, there are definite steps to this whole thing. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to do the wet part of it. You're going to take a wire brush and you're going to scrub as much of that gook off as you want to get off. And you can't get it all off with the wire brush, so then you take steel wool. So wire brushes, steel wool. Do the handles too, okay? Um, be gentle. <laughs> They, might, they can break. I mean, they're not indestructible. They're pretty tough, but they're not indestructible. The main way that you're going to break them is not as much of pressure from your hands, but banging them into something else, like another board or the side of the sink. So, you know, just use common sense on that. So, step one, uh, wet clean. Um, step two, um, should have brought a towel. Actually, I'll use this towel. We'll just blot them a little bit dry. They don't have to be totally dry. And you're going to go to the drill press station. And you can either drill press your own, and Fred's going to show you and help you doing that. If you really don't want to do it, we'll just do it for you. Um, so you, you're going to drill press the hole where the cork goes, and that, through that hole is where you're going to do the next step, which is to clean out all the goop that's in there. Seeds, membranes, it's slimy goop, and yeah, it stinks. So, um, it's a half inch diameter. I use a Forstner bit because I like the uniformity of it so that when I carve my course, I can just carve them the same size. It's so much easier than the way I used to do it. It's unbelievable. You can, you can wet clean the insides, but we're not going to do that today because then that makes it take two days and we don't have that much time. So, um, dry cleaning is fine. It's maybe not quite as thorough as wet cleaning, but it'll do. It's, you're also less likely to break your board if you dry clean it, okay? So, that's when, I see you guys have brought tools. Some uh, needle nose pliers are great because I know I don't have enough of those. I have all the tools up here if you need them. What you're going to do is after you drill your pole, then you're going to clean out that gook. And the way you're going to do it is um, uh, with bent screwdrivers, I use weeding tools. 
and you're going to want to reach in through the cork hole. You know, a lot of it first you can just shake out the loose stuff, get rid of that, and then you're just going to gently scrape along the inside wall, okay? And um, I would recommend that while you're doing that, this is the most likely place that you're going to make, you know, you're going to break up. And I don't want you guys to do that. So, when I'm scraping, see, your hole's going to be up here. You got your tool in there. Whatever surface I'm scraping against, I have my hand on it, so I'm sort of monitoring the pressure while I'm doing it. And if you feel that gourd starting to go, back off, okay? Don't push so hard. They're actually pretty tough. You can scrape pretty hard, but you do want to just keep an eye on it. The other most likely place you're, you're likely to crack them is the cork holes here. As you're sticking that thing in, you're sort of jamming it along the cork hole if you're not careful. Be careful there, okay? Um, and don't worry, when we're actually doing this, I'll come around and just make sure. So clean out the inside. Inside's clean. Next step, carve your corks. Um, I brought champagne corks because wine corks aren't big enough unless you want to try and clean out a hose show through a thing like that big. So I use unpressed champagne corks, got a big bag of them. Um, everybody get a couple. And I brought extras in case you under carve them or whatever. Um, so carve your corks. Uh, then you just put in, I brought popcorn for everybody, that's what I use. I'm still waiting for my shipment of hota from Zimbabwe. You put as much popcorn in there as feels good. You check it, you take out, you put in. You put your cork in and you can be done now, okay? Um.